Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So I've got something a little bit different for you here. I do talk occasionally about firearms, although I'm mostly talking about swords on this channel, as you guys know. Um, I have been talking less about firearms since YouTube's stupid uh, treatment of firearms channels. But anyway, uh, that aside, so uh, recently I was um, bidding on a few things in an auction and um, it turns out I didn't get any of the swords I wanted, but I did get a firearm, an antique firearm that, uh, that I thought that was interesting. I didn't really know what I was bidding on at the time very much. Uh, and then it turned up, and here it is. So at first sight, you might kind of think, ooh, it's some type of rifle or shotgun, isn't it? It's clearly percussion lock. So when we've got a uh, nipple on the back there, which we put percussion caps onto, half cock and full cock, it all works perfectly well, holds nicely and solidly. It's got a good tight spring um, on half cock. And half cock, if I push the trigger, nothing can uh, happen, obviously. Gun safety folks, I know that this is not loaded. This is a muzzle loading gun. It's not a breech loader, but it's a muzzle loading gun. I've checked with the ramrod, blah, blah, blah. I know it's not loaded. So no safety issues to, to be worried about here. Um, so half cock holds completely solidly. That's um, sort of the safe um, sort of setting. It's, a, it's kind of the equivalent of a, of a Victorian safety um, catch. But once we go to full cock, then now a, a bit of a squeeze on the trigger will release the hammer. Um, so at first sight, it's kind of got the arrangement of an Enfield rifle, uh, 1853 pattern. Um, uh, it's got a nice um, sort of golden aged colour to the stock, uh, lots, of, lots of knocks and bumps, it's not in fantastic condition, it's got very light pitting on the um, surface of the, of the barrel. Um, and in fact all of the parts, although I have to say the lock plate, which is this plate which uh, inside is the lock, so the spring mechanism essentially and the trigger mechanism, the lock plate is actually not very pitted, um, uh, but, the, but the barrel um, and the trigger guard um, and the butt plate are slightly pitted, not deeply pitted, surface pitting. So this is probably, I've had a look down the barrel uh, with a torch, this is probably safe to use with relatively low uh, charges of black powder, um, or indeed uh, to use in a sh as a shotgun, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and uh, we've got the uh, the sight, the adjustable sight here. It's a little bit stiff. I need to get some penetrating oil in there. Um, but you can flip it up and move this slider up and down. It's a pretty much standard sight that you'd find on Enfield rifles of the 1850s and 60s. Um, leaf sight type thing. And um, it's sighted up to, what's this one? Sighted up to a thousand yards. Uh, obviously your chance of hitting anything or hitting what you're aiming at at a thousand yards are fairly slim. But as a volley sight, um, having put that up, if, if you slide this up, this is a bit stiff so I won't do this on camera, it does move but it's a bit stiff at the moment, you slide that up to a thousand yards and obviously the further up you put that sight mark, the lower down essentially the, the butt gets in relation to the muzzle and so the higher your trajectory would be and the further you're going to send a bullet, quite simply. And uh, to give you an indication, if I was shooting at a thousand yards, that would be the elevation of the rifle at that point. If I was shooting at a hundred yards, it would be about that. So pretty much at a hundred yards, you're shooting what looks like almost straight on. And at a thousand yards, you're shooting at, I don't know how many degrees up that is, but maybe about 10, 15 degrees uh, elevated off horizontal. So, um, uh, pretty standard Enfield, but you'll notice it has no uh, force stock, as it were. The, the stock is missing off the front, and that is, uh, as, I, as far as I can judge, um, it's because it's been sporterized. That is, it's been turned into a sporting rifle or hunting rifle, rather than, so either target or hunting, can't tell which, um, rather than a military rifle. Although originally, the wood of the stock, which you can see goes to here and is then has been rounded off long ago in its history, judging by the colour of the wood, would have carried all the way up to about there. And there should have been originally a bayonet lug, uh, which has probably been professionally, well, has been professionally removed off the side of the barrel because I can't see any sign of it whatsoever. Um, so originally the stock would have carried on up to here, there would have been a bayonet lug. This seems to be a two band length. So they came in two band length and three band lengths. Um, this seems to be a two band which were used by rifles um, rather than line infantry and so this probably would have had a, a bayonet lug on, the, lug on the side for a 
Yatagan bayonet, a, a, various, a sword bayonet rather than a socket bayonet. Uh, you'll notice the ramrod is still here, so originally the ramrod would have been hidden inside the stock up till about that point and you'd only see that much extending. Now the ramrod um, only goes that far into the stock, it's got a little threaded end at the end to put a cleaning uh, brush on, um, but it, it's quite secure, it goes far enough in that um, it, it's fairly secure and doesn't wobble around too much. It has to be said Guns that were intentionally made from the outset to have a shorter stock like this would usually have a supporting uh, bit for the ramrod underneath the barrel there. But this doesn't have that <clears throat> because it wasn't made to have an exposed barrel for that full length. Anyway, it's a nicely made thing, but a few things about it. So first of all, the manufacturer's name is on the um, uh, backside of the stock over here, and it's Murcott & Co. Uh, I think that was Theophilus Murcott. Uh, who is quite a good gun maker of the mid 19th, well, mid through to the later 19th century, in fact. Um, and also, there's a series you won't be able to see, unfortunately, there's no point in me bringing it close to the camera. Um, there's a series of Victorian proof marks here. So we've got a V under a crown, various numbers, um, and a P. I'm not sure what P stands for. Maybe someone out there knows. A P under a crown. Um, but basically, this has been, this barrel has been proved, um, tested. But, this is the this is the thing of note, and this is really why I'm showing you this uh, rifle. I was going to call it a rifle. So, in fact, before I get to the lock plate, I'm going to mention. So, the first thing when I got this is I thought, ah, it's an Enfield rifle that's been sporterized. I wonder what the bore's like. And I went to look down the bore, and I was like, where's the rifling? <laughs> um, and I was like, maybe it's just because there's a little bit of pitting around there. Maybe it's just disguise. And I started feeling around, and I went and got a torch, and I looked down the barrel. Uh, best thing incidentally is to get a small torch that you literally drop down the barrel shining upwards um, and look down it. Again, gun safety folks, I know this is not loaded. Um, and actually the, the pitting wasn't too bad inside the barrel at all. There's certainly a lot of um, metal there. Uh, you could say, very safely use it as a shotgun. Um, and I looked down the barrel and there was no sight of any rifling, grooved rifling, at all. And I thought, well, okay, that's really strange. Hold on, let's see what it says on the lock plate. So I turned it around and looked on the lock plate and it said, Lancaster's patent. Ah, Lancaster's patent. So that starts ringing some bells. Because when I've been reading accounts from the Indian Mutiny and the, that kind of period, the 1850s, there are mentions of Lancaster's rifles. And I'd vaguely read stuff about them when I've been reading about Enfield rifles previously. Now, Enfield rifles had traditional grooved rifling. So um, I'm sure practically everybody watching this channel will know that inside a rifle is rifling and rifling makes the bullet spin and by spinning the bullet you increase accuracy and uh, to some degree you can increase range but primarily you increase accuracy. Um, <clears throat> so um, we're accustomed to grooves inside um, essentially milled or, or ground inside barrels to give that spin because that's the traditional type of rifling that we have today. And in fact the Enfield rifle, the 1853 Enfield rifle, um, has grooved rifling. But this doesn't. Um, but Lancaster's patent was something very specific. So when I first saw this I thought is this an Indian one? So um, after the Indian mutiny what the British government did was they um, uh, took all the Enfield rifles, most of the Enfield rifles, back off Indian troops and they reissued them or they stripped them out of the rifling and reissued them with smooth bores. The idea being that um, because they didn't really trust the Indian forces very much at this point, um, if they should have to, if British forces, in other words British British rather than Indian British, um, soldiers should have to fight an Indian uprising again, in theory, the British soldiers would have rifles and the Indian soldiers would have smoothbores and therefore would be at a disadvantage, both in accuracy and range. Um, so I wondered if maybe this was a one that had had the rifling stripped out, but when I saw Lancaster's patent, of course, I went on to Google um, and started reading. Now, it's interesting, a lot of websites talk about Lancaster's patent, but don't explicitly explain what that means. Um, and I can now tell you what it means. So a lot of them will say, ah, oh, Lancaster's patent was that it had an oval instead of a circular barrel. Um, not really visibly oval, um, very, very slightly oval. Okay, so if you look at it, 
it. I can't really tell that that's an oval, but I trust that it is because it's called a Lancaster's patent. But what I'd, when I'd read that before, I'd always um, assumed that it was oval and had rifling. And it does, but it doesn't have rifling as you and I would normally understand it. What it is, is if you imagine an oval, okay, that's like this, as it goes along the barrel, it turns like this. So essentially, it's an oval that's twisted along. But it's so slight of an oval that when you look at these, and if you ever see one of these again and you think it's a, a Victorian rifle uh, and it says Lancaster's patent on the side, it looks like a shotgun <laughs> looking down it. It just looks like a smoothbore, uh, like a musket. Um, and, um, and you can't, I can't really see or feel the oval at all, but it must be there. So there we go, Lancaster's patent, quite interesting. And um, these were quite popular, and in tests they found that this oval rifling, that doesn't really look like rifling as we normally think of it, um, up to a thousand yards is as accurate, or in some tests more accurate, than the traditional grooved rifling of the time. And of course the big advantage of this oval bore that doesn't have these grooves. There's two big advantages I can think of. Number one is fouling, okay? So one of the problems with grooves, with, um, with normal grooves in rifling, is that when you shoot a muzzle loader, it continuously builds up stuff, lead, residue of black powder, this kind of stuff, bits of wadding, into the grooves, and that fills up the grooves, which um, makes the gun less accurate and harder to load. And the second point is to do with loading. If you've got a what's essentially a smoothbore oval barrel, it's a lot quicker and easier to load um, because you're not going to get the fouling problem. But also, one of the problems with loading muzzle loading rifles, remember you're putting everything in the front end, you're not putting anything in the back end, is that you have to ram everything down there. And in fact, they sometimes use mallets for hammering the ramrod to push the bullet and the wadding and everything else down the, down the barrel um, because they were such a tight fit. And they had to be a tight fit for the rifling to take effect and for it to work. Um, whereas with this smoothbore, um, option with the oval, you don't have so much of a problem because you don't have so much friction essentially. Um, and you don't have so much fouling as mentioned before. And finally, there's one other interesting thing that I would note about this type of oval smoothbore rifle. It is a smoothbore, but it is a rifle. And that's just a weird thing because normally smoothbore means not a rifle. But anyway, it's a smoothbore rifle. <laughs> um, one of the last advantages I can think of is you can use it like a shotgun with, I can't see any particular disadvantage whatsoever. I mean, it's probably equivalent to what a, it's smaller than a 12 bore. It's probably something like a 14, 14 bore, something like that. Um, maybe 16, I'm not sure. But um, you could absolutely use this as a shotgun without any problem of having the grooved rifling that you normally have with a rifle obstructing the shot or anything like that because it's a smoothbore. So, fantastic. I don't really know why they didn't um, while they weren't more successful, I know from uh, period accounts that some hunters absolutely loved them uh, and some soldiers, as I say, from the Indian Mutiny, um, Lancaster's patent rifle was quite popular amongst some people in, in India. Um, so there we go. I think it's a great idea. It's a smoothbore muzzle loading rifle that you could use as a shotgun quite easily, and, uh, but it's got the accuracy of a grooved rifled Enfield musket. Great, fantastic. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna have this checked out by a gunsmith and um, if it's okay to shoot, I might stick it on my, um, well, I could stick it, I don't know whether I stick it on my shotgun stick or my firearm stick because it's not rifled. Wow, I'll have to look into that one. But anyway, I might shoot it, I might not. I might just keep it as a curiosity. But there we go, nice thing it is, a Mercut & Co. Lancaster's patent 1850s rifle. Cheers, folks.